now. Um, I'm going to hand over to Professor Catherine Clark, who's going to introduce the centre and uh, a couple of notices as well. Over to you, Catherine. Thanks so much, Adam. Welcome, everyone. It's lovely to see so many people here this evening for what's going to be a really wonderful presentation. I'm really looking forward to it. Adam, I think you did a good job of introducing the centre. I don't need to do that again. Uh, I just have a, a couple of notices that I wanted to share. Um, as Adam said, it's lovely to see some uh, some, some new uh, visitors to, to our event, people who, who are joining us for the first time at one of our events this evening. But I can also see lots of um, lots of regulars and friends of the, the centre here in the audience. And the first um, piece of news I wanted to share is 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 sad. Um, I wanted to um, pass on the news that many of you will be aware of already, but the very sadly Derek Keane, former professor in urban history at the IHR and founder of the Centre for Metropolitan History, very sadly died uh, recently. And as Adams already mentioned, the work of the Centre for Metropolitan History is continued in, in our work in the Centre for the History of People, Place and Community. So. Um, that is sad news. I wanted to make you aware of that. Um, on the IHR website, there's a piece where Professor Matthew Davies himself, a former director of the CMH and now executive dean at Birkbeck, remembers Derek. And that piece includes um, a link to a website created by the family with um, details of how to access the funeral um, and send condolences um, if you wish to do that. And Derek's family and friends are very much in our thoughts um, at the moment. He played such a formative role in um, uh, place-based research in the, in, in the IHR and now in our centre. Secondly, on a very different note, I want to mention an, another of the key projects in the Centre for the History of People, Place and Community, and that's the Victoria County History. And at the moment, the Victoria County History is a partner in an AHRC funded project, Towns and the Cultural Economies of Recovery. And just today, we've launched a mini project within that, thinking about how writing future local histories rather than local histories of the past might help us to think about um, our aspirations for our places and feed story and imagination into policy making. So do have a look at this little mini initiative. Um, if you use the hashtag, hashtag VCH Future History on Twitter, you can see what's gone on already. Um, Adam uh, put a lovely VCH Future History thread up on Tunbridge earlier today. And please join in because we want to start a conversation about what understanding of the past of our places can bring to future policy. And as I said, what creativity, imagination, storytelling and, and hopefulness, I suppose, can contribute to our places in the future. So thank you very much. I'll hand back to our chair and look forward to this evening's presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, um, and I've just popped the link to Catherine's blog, which introduces the VCH Future History project in uh, in the chat. So if you'd like to take a look at that at your leisure, that'd be wonderful. Anyway, um, let's get on to the matter in hand and uh, say uh, good evening and, and welcome. Nos way so to Sean Evans and Scott Lloyd, um, who will be discussing, who will be introducing their project on deep mapping of a state archives in Wales project. Uh, funded by the uh, Arts and Humanities Research Council. Um, uh, just to introduce uh, just our speakers, Sean Evans is uh, Director of the Institute for the Study of Welsh Estates at the Bank University of Bangor, um, and uh, his particular interest in this subject stems partly from his PhD, but also from his background. Uh, Sean was brought up in the Moston Estate in North Wales, um, and uh, so this is very much a method sort of research and he's lived it. Um, Scott Lloyd uh, is a, works for the Royal Commission of the Ancient Historical Monuments of Wales, uh, which is one of those organisations which actually has a shorter title in Welsh, um, which is always refreshing, um, and uh, is a specialist in the GIS and so, uh, and so forth, but is also doing a PhD at Bristol um, on our fear in uh, reimaginings of uh, I can't remember precisely what the title is. I'm really sorry, Scott. Um, you can tell you about that later. Um, so uh, without me whittling on any further, I'm going to hand over now to our speakers, to Sean and to Scott. And when you're ready, gentlemen.
Uh, Dioch Adam, thanks very much, Adam and Catherine, for, for the welcome and um, thanks very much for the invite to, to speak to the, the centre this evening. It's great to see so many familiar uh, names amongst the, those attending. Um, so over the next little while, I'm going to talk about um, a project, a collaborative uh, project funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council. Uh, that was awarded early last year um, and we delayed the start date and, until September and so the project's been running since, since September in quite challenging circumstances with the partial closure of archives not being able to get into the the area or actually researching and actually not being able to, to meet up physically as a, as a research team either. So what I'm gonna do is outline some of the things that we hope to achieve in the project, some of the, the context for the project and um, some of the, um, uh, the debates um, and the aspects of history that we're hoping to, to contribute to. And then for the second part of the, the talk, I'm gonna hand over to Scott from the Royal Commission, who's gonna uh, show you the interesting thing, the, 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 the building of the, the framework that's gonna, that's gonna host our, our, our deep map and the, the layers of records that we're hoping to incorporate into that. Um, so it's probably worth starting by um, going through the project team. It's it's an interdisciplinary project team and it's a collaborative project. Um, and this, this setup's really key to its development. It couldn't happen without the perspectives and the insights and the expertise of the, of the various project partners. Uh, so Adam's already introduced me, but um, in addition to me, there's Julie Mathias from Aberystwyth University who, um, um, is one of the lecturers on the uh, the, the long established archive course at, uh, at Aberystwyth and has an interest in in record keeping practices and especially estate archives. Um, in addition to, to Scott from the Royal Commission, John Dollery um, is the GIS officer for the for the Royal Commission. So he's working with Scott to develop the GIS framework for the project. Uh, at Bangor, my colleague Gary Robinson is an archaeologist with an interest in, in landscapes, so we've got that archaeological perspective. And um, as well, we've got two uh, archival cultural heritage partners, um, North East Wales Archives, Flincher and Demshire Record Officers, and the National Library of Wales, who are the custodians of much of the, the historical collections that we're hoping to integrate into the, into the deep map. Um, we also have an advisory board um, which offers various perspectives on the, the areas, the, uh, the academic areas and the, the broader cultural heritage landscape and historic environment, archival landscape, uh, where the project sits, I suppose. Um, and again, their, their perspectives and their insight is really, really important for taking the project forward. Um, just to give a little bit of an introduction as to where the project comes to. It's uh, an initiative of the Institute for the Study of Welsh Estates, um, which was established at Bangor University a few years ago, very much on the model of similar research centres that had been set up um, in Ireland and in Yorkshire um, um, previously. And the, the basic objective is to enhance knowledge and understanding of the role and influence of estates and country houses in the histories and cultures and landscapes of Wales. And uh, we operate as a partnership in the university uh, between the university archives and special collections, which houses a fantastic collation of estate papers, um, uh, which were sort of gathered up by the librarian um, at Bangor from the, from the 1920s, 30s onwards, um, and, um, and colleagues from across the university, really. So we're very much a collections based research centre uh, really interested in, in developing mutual partnerships and collaborations with organisations in the heritage, archives, historic environment, um, rural affairs um, sectors um, um, as, a, as a facilitator of the research that we want to undertake. Uh, we've got perspectives from, um, from, 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 from law and Cymraeg and English literature and forestry all feeding into to our research projects and from the very beginning as well we've had a, a significant focus on public and community engagement and many of our projects so far have been uh, doctoral and early career focused. We've currently got eight um, um, doctoral researchers 
uh, and the first of our doctoral researchers um, successfully defended her viva back in, in January, January and I was delighted to say that she proceeded to a, an IHR Economic um, History Society postdoctoral fellowship um, um, following that PhD. So if you want to find more, if you want to find out more about the work of ISWE, uh, the link's there for you to do so. Um, so this AHRC project really important in terms of the development of the institute and we see legacy and follow-on initiatives and funding opportunities stemming from it in collaboration with the other partners but for years to come hopefully so the objective of the project is to construct a, a deep map um, um, a deep uh, cadastral map um, which is capable of incorporating a variety of the geolocatable references and records uh, within the archives produced by or associated with landed estates in a case study area across the period um, uh, circa 1500 to, to 1930. So through to that period where in Wales as elsewhere, you're seeing a rapid decline and breakup um, of these holdings and their associated country houses too. Um, a deep map um, has been described as a finely detailed depiction of place. Um, it's an exploratory digital environment, which is made up from a layering uh, and, a, uh, and a pooling of the different types of media, um, um, which can be linked to place. So a multi-layered storehouse of information on the, the, the physical features of the, um, um, the buildings and landscape features, but also the events and activities and meanings and, um, and understandings which underpin in constructions of place over time. Um, the, the development of deep mapping um, initiatives as part of a, a broader body of work in spatial humanities and uh, historical GIS over a 30 year period, um, the deep map projects have tended to be characterized by um, uh, an incorporation of the more intangible and ideological dim dimensions of place. So um, drawing um, from primary sources such as literature, folklore and oral history. Um, our project is slightly different in that um, initially, at least, it um, it retains an explicit focus on the tangible and the physical and on the, the 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 landscape on the landscape features. Our GIS is also slightly different um, in that um, yes, we we are undertaking those elementary stages of uh, of scanning and georeferencing and layering of cartographic records, uh, but we're hoping to sort of go a step beyond this, and Scott will explain this in more detail, towards a, if you like, a form of total digitization, which involves the, the comprehensive uh, polygonization and then tabulization of, of maps, but also other records too, to extract all the information they contain and then to position them um, in, a, in a spatial context um, and to do this at landscape scale too. Um, so the one of the ambitions of the project um, is to create a, a digital tool, a map, which allows users, um, members of the public, other academics and so forth to click on a particular landscape feature, whether that be a, a house uh, or, um, or a field um, within the system, and by doing so can pull up um, a, a storehouse of references to that feature as built up through a layering um, of the, the records which we've incorporated in, into the system um, over time. Our case study area, um, shorthand I suppose, would be Dufferin Allen. Uh, so it's, a, it's an area which is about 125 kilometres squared in northeast Wales, so in the historical counties of Denby and Flint. Um, it's situated on the uh, eastern slopes of the Cloidian Range um, in the Vale of the River Allen. Um, and broadly comprises the, um, the old parishes of Mould, including the chap uh, chaplainries of Nerquis and Trithen in Flintshire, and then uh, further south in Denbyshire, Llanveres, Llandegla, and Llanarmon and Yal. Um, and it's an area which is roughly synonymous with the old medieval Welsh commotes, um, which later became lordships of Ostradalin uh, or Mould and Yarl, uh, which later became incorporated into the, into the joint lordship of Bromfield and, and Yale. 
Um, and it's an area which for a long time from the 16th, 17th, 18th century has been recognized as, a, uh, as an area which is absolutely filled, packed with numerous ancient mansions and handsome seats, the residences of some of the principal families of the, the neighborhood. And that's one of the reasons why, why we selected it because it's a, it's a part of Wales. We're still in the landscape. You can see it, it, it crammed with multiple um, landed, landed influence within a, within a relative relatively small area and we, we're looking to explore the, the dynamics of that. So some of the, um, the, the more prominent estates that you might be familiar with, um, Bodidris, Gosani, Hartsheath or Herseth, uh, Leeswood, uh, Nerquis, Pentrahobin, Plasteg, Riel and Tower or Tour um, are incorporated um, with about another, another 15, 15 others varying in size and composition and influence over time, of course. Um, as I said, it's, it's an interesting area because it's, um, it's an area where one family was never dominant. Um, so what you've got instead is sort of a patchwork of neighbouring and intermixed um, estates, um, which, are, which, are, which sort of piece together like a jigsaw to make up the, the, the land holding interest in, in the area. Um, it's also an interesting area, area, and one of the reasons we selected it is because it combines different um, di different landscape types. So you've got the the vibrant market town of Mould, um, combined with um, a, a variety of smaller dispersed rural settlements, upland um, agriculture um, on the Cluidian range, but also lowland agriculture in the Vale of Mould itself. And then from as early as the, uh, as the 16th century and certainly into the 18th century, yeah, immense industrial activity. So the mining for, for lead and coal, iron and clay. Um, and it, and it's, it, I guess, the area's positioning as well, um, not, not too far away from the, the England-Wales border is, is interesting in terms of its, its cultural um, dynamics too. If we wanted to identify the, the plastai or the country houses uh, which existed, uh, which still exist in this area, we've got numerous sources which uh, enable us to, to, to identify the, the, the places, the, the, the buildings which were deemed to be significant for, for a variety of reasons from the 16th century right the, way, right, right the way through into the 19th and the early 20th century. So from the late 15th into the 16th century, um, the, the manuscripts, the genealogical and the, uh, the manuscripts of poetry, uh, which were produced, included lists of uh, genealogies and, um, and poems uh, which, um, which provided the lineages of this, this emerging or, or gentry class. Um, and in association with these lineages, you often get references to particular sites of influence. So the, the, which would become over the generations established as, uh, as Wales's plastai or, or country houses. Then proceeding through the, the centuries, you've got things like um, the Edward Floyd's parochialia. So Edward Floyd, the, the great Welsh um, antiquarian um, in 1699 sent out a survey to all the parishes in Wales and the returns he, he received um, regularly, uh, habitually included lists of the principal houses and their owners and other landscape features as well. So we've got a, we've got a really extraordinary list of about 70 houses in the, in the project area, uh, which allow us to identify these sites. And then from the early 18th century, we've got the, the, the beginning of, uh, of cartographic sources, um, landscape scales, cartographic sources, Sources. So William Williams's map of Demershire and Flintshire, um, um, John Evans's map of the six counties of North Wales, and then the um, uh, the OS survey drawings held by the the British Library as well. In addition to things like Thomas Pennant's travel writing, so late eighteenth century Thomas Pennant from Flintshire knew the area very well, had lots of kinship collect connections with the area, um, travelled around Mould and records the the different houses on their own and aspects of their history and heritage and and, and so forth as well. And many of these places um, still form a prominent part of the, the local landscape too, um, despite 
um, often significant changes in their ownership and their function um, as well. Many of these now are, are, are not uh, have been detached from their um, fr from the estates that they were previously associated with, or the estates that are still associated with them have sort of been significantly reduced. So it's 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 less easy to comprehend their their role in the landscape because they've been attached from the estate which historically um, they were at the centre of. Um, and of course, many of these structures are formally listed um, and others are incorporated into um, various historical environment records and databases too. So on the on the screen here, we've got Tour, um, the big image on the on the left, the home of the, the Wynn family, and on the, the images on the right, uh, plus tag. Um, right on the border of our, uh, our project area, actually situated in the parish of, of Hope, built by the, the Trevors, uh, Pentra Hobbin um, and, uh, and, and, and Gossani. Um, but of course, an, an estate landscape was more than the country house. And so as part of how we're approaching this, pro this project, how we're, we're seeking to understand uh, est estate landscapes, um, well, one of the things we're looking at is, is how land provided a foundation for its owner's position in society. So how land ownership underpinned gentry and aristocratic identity. So in medieval Wales, the, the primary marker of status in societies was your ancestry, who you claim descent from, but increasingly into, into the period that we're primarily interested in, land is a, is a key indicator key uh, requisite of, um, of, of, of gentle identity. Um, the ownership of land, of course, also afforded significant capacity for, for landowners to control how this land um, was, um, was fashioned, how it was used, um, how it was managed, lived in and worked um, as well. So I suppose we're, in approaching the project and uh, approaching what a landed estate is, where we're seeking to combine sort of three uh, interlinked perspectives. One is the, the sort of the long standing landscape history focus um, established by W.G. Hoskins and others on the making of landscape over multiple um, generations, active efforts to, uh, to make a landscape. Um, the second uh, drawing on the works of Dennis Cosgrove and others, seeing estates as social and cultural constructs uh, which can be seen, uh, to, to, to take his quote, as constituting a discourse through which social groups historically have framed themselves and their relations with both the land and with other human groups too. So here you've got the dynamics between landowners, their tenants, their neighbours, uh, the, the people who worked on the estates and so forth as well. And also important perspectives from uh, Nicola White, for example, who alongside these two previous um, approaches to estate landscapes sees it as something that has to be seen as lived in, as a lived experience, which is produced through the activities and practices and memories of the ordinary people who lived and worked um, within its uh, spheres too. So to understand estate landscapes, we, knew, we need to move beyond the country house and its immediate garden and parkland setting to consider, if you like, the wider vernacular world of, of farms and fields and woods and hedges and, and trees and churches and so forth as well. And indeed the individuals and the communities which lived um, and worked um, um, in, in this setting within this framework too. Um, it's in, probably important to say as well that most landed estates included in the project area um, pursued a, a, a complex mix of land uses. So you, you've got the, the functions and the purpose of the country house, it's surrounding parkland, um, alongside um, agricultural activities, um, the tenanted farms and cottages, um, forestry, leisure, and, and in our area, as we've discussed as well, um, in industry too. Um, and it's important to say as well that estates varied significantly in their size, character, and composition, um, depending on the nature of their geographical setting and the identities of their owners and inhabitants. So one of the things we're trying to do with this project is to offer a, a Welsh case study um, into this quite vibrant um, international study of, of, a, of estate landscapes. I think one of the potentially the most the most exciting things that um, that can come from from this project is some um, methodology uh, methodological contributions as to how archives 
can potentially in future be be searched spatially. Um, so most of the archives um, are what we're talking about in the project area, most of them over the course of their existence from the late medieval period through to the early 20th century produced copious records, documentation relating to the, the acquisition of land, the inheritance of land and how land was managed um, and a whole range of other activities associated with the estate and its influence across local, national um, and indeed global context too. Um, and these estate archives, um, they form a, an important part of the, the, the nation's archival holdings, um, so often form prominent parts in the, the collections of county record offices, university archives and, and national institutions such as the National Library of Wales in Aberystwyth. And one of the things we're, we're looking to explore in this project is how our GIS, how our, our deep map will allow records from these archives to be arranged, visualized and analyzed, not only chronologically, but also in ways that are, are, are spatial and linked to their landscape settings. So any of you, any of you who have previously try to engage with estate archives often arranged into seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 catalogues on the, uh, in, the, in, in the search room. Um, and when you go to the archives, um, they can be really, really difficult to engage with, yet they're packed with information relating to individual places um, over time um, and sometimes extending over, over centuries. But it can be really difficult to comprehend the place data and the place relevant information within these collections. And indeed to understand the nature of the connections, the nature of the relations between different records within the same archive and indeed records from multiple archives too. So one of the things we're looking to do is to put archives in a direct relation with the landscape features um, that, that, that they relate to. Um, and we've already during the project identified significant opportunities for cross-referencing uh, between different archives. So one of the things um, my colleague Julie, uh, Julie Mathias and I have, have just, just worked out over the, the last week or so is uh, one of the 18th century um, estate maps of the Gosani estate, which is held in the National Library of Wales, had its um, um, accompanying reference book, um, which names the, the fields and the tenants and the the rent they were, they were paying didn't have that with it in the National Library of Wales, but we think we've located it in, uh, in Flintshire Record Office. So this allows us to sort of reconnect to those, those records which have become um, separated over time, but also as well finding really interesting opportunities which we're looking to explore in the future about how the, the records that we're putting into the system, including on the names of the people who lived in particular houses, the names of tenants and so forth, how these build up over time, how we might use census records or parish records to add to that picture to, to sort of keep building this, um, this map over time too. Um, so what we want to do with the project um, is, is to create a, a model and methodology which will allow archives to be, to, to be searched spatially as well. And, um, and, and this has, we think, numerous advantages. So just to talk a little bit more about what, where the, the project is situated um, um, intellectually, um, over, over recent years, there's been a significant academic interest in, um, in designed landscape, otherwise referred to as planned or polite or status or elite landscapes um, in different geographical contexts. Um, these historically, these studies historically have tended to focus on the, the sort of the famous aristocratic, nationally renowned aristocratic mansions in England and tend to focus on the, 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 the designs implemented by um, famous landscape architects such as um, Humphrey Repton and Capability Brown and, and, and so forth as well. But over recent years, there's been a significant um, effort within landscape history um, to sort of broaden this perspective, to undertake multi-period analysis, looking at continuities and changes over time, including the retention of older medieval um, 
and prehistoric features uh, within these designed landscapes into the future too, but also the need to pool perspectives and insights from multiple disciplines, so from different approaches to the study of the past um, with archaeology and historical geography, um, for example, um, as well. So some of the major themes in this body of work have been on the various um, the complex processes of improvements and what that means and enclosure as well, um, on estate management, the role of custom and memory in the landscape, uh, on rural protest, um, on forms of inheritance, on the relations between landowners and tenants, um, on cartography, um, on, and on gentry culture and the country house. So these landscape history is increasingly sort of blending these to, to fully understand um, these landscapes too. What our project is doing is not focusing on an individual estate, but focusing on a landscape where you've got multiple estates all intermixing um, and sort of competing with, with each other over time too. In a Welsh context um, too, we, we hope that this project will offer a, a distinctive contribution to, to, to what is a, a gap in the historiography of Wales, but also in, the, in this broader international scholarship on, on designed landscapes. So the, the country house and the estate does not really have a, um, a, a significant presence in the um, in the historiography um, of, um, of Wales. And interesting to explore why that might be. I think Wales has a, a geographical imagination which is, is full of competing and contradictory strands, including industrialization, rural and rurality, um, but popular protest and radicalism, but also this idea of um, conquest and colonialism, and also cultural and linguistic vitality and myth and legend. And this you know, this this complex understanding of the Welsh landscape doesn't tend to leave much space for a consideration of the historically significant role and presence of, um, of, of the landed estate. And I think part of that is, as well is from the, the late 19th century, there developed a really prominent political narrative which sought to, 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 to paint the owners of these places and indeed the, as structures um, in society as a whole are somehow not quite belonging to Wales as anglicised as, as something that doesn't belong and I, I think there's been a sort of continuation of that into the historiography into the 20th century too. The exceptions that you have to this um, are one is on um, the, the multi um, multi period focus on the role um, of the of, of, of the gentry in Welsh society and their political and cultural um, and social um, role in their communities. Um, and the second is, as well has been a significant effort to understand the early development of estates um, as products um, of the breakdown in the, the Welsh legal uh, system of Cyfran, um and the, 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 the breakup of um, the traditional way in which most land in Wales was, was held in the, in the, in, in the Gwely. Um, so from the, the 14th and 15th centuries, and then finally with the Acts of Union, you see the, the Welsh medieval landowning system breaking down and allowing, facilitating the emergence and the growth of, um, of landed estates in, in Wales, coupled with the introduction of primogenitor too. Um, so to understand the, the estate landscapes of Wales, we're required to pull together quite a diverse mix of um, um, of, of work on, on agriculture by people like David Howell, um, on vernacular architecture and place names, on woodlands, industrial heritage, estate mapping, uh, to create an, a foundation for understanding estate landscapes. For, for our particular project area, there's some really interesting earlier work being done. Um, um, by uh, Dorothy Sylvester um, and, and, and Alfred Owen, um, Alfred Palmer too, um, and Colin Thomas's work on, um, um, on landscape change in Wales and Bob Sylvester's work on mapping is also of interest to us too. And we very much hope that our findings will complement and, and enhance the work of existing databases and, um, and records on the historic environment as well. 
So our overarching research themes are on land ownership. So tracing the chronologies of estate building within the area, um, the, 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 the processes of purchase and inheritance and exchange and so forth, which allowed for the buildup of, of a landed, in, a landed estate um, over time. Um, we, can, we can trace this by, by using the, the, the estate archives. Um, how that land was then used and managed um, especially with the, the focus, the mixed focus on um, ag agricultural improvement and landowner tenant relations as well with the, with the significant industrial ventures you've got going on in this area too. And then the ways in with the focus on the landscape itself and the ways in which landowners and other people involved in the estate sought to refashion the material environment of the of the area um, in their own interests as well and in line with particular aesthetic ideals. And then I suppose alongside and underneath all of these free free themes, the the role of record keeping and archives in facilitating and recording these changes too. There's also some really interesting particulars about our case study area, which we're looking to, to, to explore. And um, coming back to Thomas Pennant's um, uh, his late 18th century tour, he summarizes some of, uh, some of these themes and strands quite nicely. When, when he's talking about um, this area, he calls it a tract filled, filled with numerous seats of gentlemen of independent fortunes, as yet not caught and absorbed by the gulfy vortex of our leviathans. These are the remnants of the custom of gavel kind, so prevalent formerly in North Wales, which have remained unimproved by those accidents which by time and chance happen to many. So, you know, extracting themes from, from what Pennant says here, what we're really looking, uh, what we're really interested in seeing if our deep map will allow us to trace and understand the legacy of Kovran and Tir Gwaliog in the post-medieval landscapes of, of, of former mar marcher lordships um, in, in Mould and, and Yarl. Uh, really interested to see if we can track that and how the, the Welsh um, land system breaks down and how you see th this um, being accommodated into the, the new landed, landed estates. Also really interested in see, tracking the, I suppose, the cultural dimensions of, um, of, of this too. So that relationship between the people and the lineages, the families who possess the land, who own the land um, and the landscape, but also the other people who live in the estate too and contribute it towards its functioning and its, and its identity too. So I suppose understanding the Welsh dimensions of, um, of gentility in the landscape, of Echelreith in, in the landscape. Um, and really interested as well, because we're taking a, a landscape approach to this as well, what the dynamics were between adjoining and intermixed estates, what happens at the boundaries of these estates, what are the, what's the evidence of cooperation, coexistence and, um, and competitiveness, I suppose, between these different, these different estates, how does that work within such a packed area uh, where you've got multiple estates competing for, for power and, uh, and status. And as well, what the relationships are between agriculture, industry, and designed landscapes. How does a, how does a landscape accommodate these different land uses and these different perspectives too? So Scott will talk um, in more detail about the construction of the, the GIS, the construction of the deep map, but I think it's worth saying our core layers, the core layers of our deep map. First of all, it's the, the first edition 25 inch to the mile OS maps um, that they provide the, the prime that, that provides the, the, the primary layer of our, uh, of our deep map and then everything else sort of hangs off that if you like as well. Um, and that dates um, uh, to the, uh, I think it's 1874 or something like that for, 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 for our area. Um, John and Scott have also been working to, um, to, to incorporate the, the town plan of mould um, into the system as well. So we've got that detailed mapping of the, of the town of the urban environment of, of mould as well, which is quite interesting. And then next we're prioritising the tithe maps and apportionments. Um, so these were digitized by the National Library of Wales a few years ago as part of a really exciting heritage lottery funded uh, project. 
And there are also enclosure maps and awards for our area as well, um, largely enclosing the, the upland um, mountain waste areas. Um, um, so we incorporate those too. And then once we've got that, those those three core layers, I suppose, then we're, it's going to be interesting. Then we start to plug in the estate relevant, the, the estate specific materials from the archives at Denbyshire um, and Flintshire and Aberystwyth. So we're going to start with the, the estate maps themselves, so that the cartographic uh, records within these um, um, within these archives, which date from the 1620s. Um, and you see a proliferation of them from the mid mid seventeenth century, uh, mid eighteenth uh, century, sorry, uh, and nineteenth century, and then those records which are rich in place uh, place name uh, and geolocatable um, data, so surveys and valuations and rentals and sale particulars, and then once we've got um, this data in the system, our hope is then we'll be able to to plug a whole range of other estate records and other records into the into the into the deep map to build up a layering um, a layered understanding of landscape as it as it uh, as it evolves across time so things like deeds but also leases settlements accounts architectural plans and perambulations um, and we've got um, estate records dating from the 14th century for our for our project area and then towards the end of the project we're really excited to explore what we can do in terms of incorporating other types of records into the system so for example um, maps of underground um, underground mining maps um, some of the um, so, some of the the, the watercolours of the area for example and 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 contributions from members of the, the community at a, a memory and memorabilia session that we're that we're hoping to to undertake and of course this will also incorporate existing online resources and databases too um my final slide was on impact and engagement but i realize i've probably over talked already so uh, perhaps if any of you want to ask about those we can address them in the question and answer session and at this point i'll hand over to scott who will show you some of the things um that um that we've been doing with the the system okay thank you sean i shall just share my screen okay so following on from what sean said is how do we do all this how do we make these records oh sorry press the share button there we go how do, how do we make these records uh, available in a spatial manner so first slide this is the actual project area we're looking at the Flintshire Denbyshire boundary running down the middle. So there's the town of Mould, and to get you location, there's Chester over there. So the starting point is the first continuous, consistent, large scale detailed mapping for Great Britain, which of course has to be the uh, 25 inch um, mapping sheets that were done for our area 1869 to 1872. Um, you can clearly see here um, we've got a uh, very detailed um 25 inch mapping buildings are colorized ponds are colorized if you can find the colorized sheets we have about 55 sheets for our project area um, and we've managed to find 52 of them i'm still missing three so i've been uh, hassling the british library for those um so i think they're on the way now to finish off the set um and also this the level of detail in here is phenomenal for the period and you can also see they went to the effort of even surveying in individual trees something that did not find its way onto the second edition. Every parcel is numbered, as you can see, and these numbers for our area were quite fortunate in that before 1880, Ordnance Survey undertook land use surveys as well. Um, this was discontinued about 1880 onwards, and these surveys were published in books of reference. So as you can see here, parcel number, acreage, land usage. So we have this complete coverage for our project area. So the Ordnance Survey mapping is the basis on which everything hangs. One of the key things we want to get out of the mapping as well is also boundary data. This is incredibly important, particularly for historic boundaries, because at the moment we have digital historic boundary layers, but they were done for different purposes done a long time ago, and now we have the facility to make them much more accurate. So we've also had a little look at the historiography of how these boundaries were produced by the um, by the Ordnance Survey. So, um, in the for this area in 1869, um, they had a system whereby the Ordnance Surveyor would come to the parish and there'd be a Mears man 
boundary man who would basically have responsibility for each, um, there'd be one for each parish. They'd walk along the parish boundary and agree on the boundary stones and the marker points along that boundary. And the ordnance surveyor would then um, create a drawing like this. So the drawing here is of, this is the boundary from the tithe map. You'll notice small lom, the pool and two stones. So you notice that shape there. And then if we go to here, we can see more lom, the pond and the two stones. And you'll see that the, um, that the ordnance surveyor has put big red crosses through the tithe boundary. So obviously the Mears men didn't agree with that. The one Mears man is named here as Edward Jones for Flanarmon, which is this side of the boundary. And you can see that the boundary that was originally, that was eventually adopted by the Northern Survey is drawn in here. And difficulty number two, see the report for the Lordship of Mould, page one, and it discusses their decision-making for this process here. So this is a really important histor historiographical source for understanding how these boundaries were actually defined legally for the first time. Another part of the process, was, so here's one of the books here, so 377A for the township of Merquis and the, the ones that border it as well. And after they'd done those initial sketch drawings, they produced this skeleton map here, which predates the printed map by three or four years. You can see the parish outline here, and this is the, this little corner here we're going to look at. Over here, you can see this is where they give us little bits of detail on either side of the parish. So this is, if you like, an earlier draft form of what became the printed map and includes often bits of information that didn't make it onto the printed map. So this is a really useful thing and we will be producing these boundaries in some detail, including with the little breaks where it shifts from the face of wall, four foot from boundary, we'll be including that as well. So you'll have a detailed study of these boundaries. So I'm quickly gonna nip across to here. So the system will be made available to people through um, this ArcGIS um, web app builder very simple to use. Um, so the first thing we had to do was get hold of our sheets. So here we can see, this is for the parish of Nurquist, it took six sheets. All of the sheets are scanned in color to a high resolution. They're then used for the georeferencing, and then we knock them down a bit to come on here, otherwise they gobble up lots of the uh, online credits and they get quite expensive. So if we zoom in, you can see the quality, once it renders out, give it a second, there we go. So it's perfectly good quality and you can see how well they stitch together and you can see the difference uh, in quality between the colors as well. So what do we do with this? We've got our maps, we've geo-referenced them against the Ordnance Survey master map. The modern master map of 2020 is a polygonized map of the whole of Britain. Now in, this, in these types of rural areas, um, there's not a great deal of change to field boundaries, etc. So using that as the basis, each of these sheets is geo-referenced to about 400 points. So 400 points per sheet, you taking in corners of fields and major points where there's correlation. Um, that is then transformed using the spline transformation, which is basically a way of ever so slightly, if you like a rubber sheet effect onto the map, and it just pulls ever so slightly to match modern survey data. Now the Ordnance Survey, um, even the modern master map has a, an error of two and a half meters in, in rural areas. And we found that the old Ordnance Survey map was of a similar standard as well, to be fair to them, they did an excellent job. So we are then able to create this layer. So we now have a polygonized layer that's geographically accurate using the first edition coordinate survey mapping from 1870. So I'm just gonna turn that off a second. So there we go. This is now our 1870 master map, if you like. Um, and this forms the basis for what follows as well. Uh, each one of these parcels has been, has attribute information, has the OS field number, has the land use from the book of reference, and also we can match the acreages. That one's what, 0.6 of an acre out. Some of them are within thousandths of an acre. This is a very useful way of us checking the way the Ordnance Survey polygonite, they chopped up the landscape in certain shapes. And it's not always clear on first edition mapping exactly where they're talking about. So this helps us to, to do that work when we're uh, attributing the polygons. So once you've got your basic data space here, you've got your basic data set. Um, 
<clears throat> and you can see it's it's accurate. You zoom in and the line width goes with it as well. So here we are, it's an 1870 data set. Um, I will come back to this in a second, but I'm just going to nip over to a, another web map. As Sean mentioned, we've also got the Ordnance Survey town plan for mould. Now this is one to 500 scale mapping, um, which is incredible, really. It's a fantastic set of detailed mapping. The six sheets that cover the town were digitized by the National Library of Wales. So we managed to get hold of those. You can see most of them are black and white, but two of them are actually available in color. I assume the others were done in color at some point, but I've not managed to find them yet. So if we just zoom in quickly, give it a second to render, okay. Here we go, we've got color sheets. And you can see here all the buildings. See, when you don't have the colour, it can be quite difficult to understand what each polygon is for. But when they're coloured in, it's much easier. If they're black, they're an outbuilding made of wood or iron, and red tends to be brick or stone houses. And you can see the red here for the walls, and they show vegetation and individual trees as well. They're rather obsessed with uh, surveying individual trees. But what we can do then is the same process from the modern Ordnance Survey master map we can then add in the polygons. So every building, every feature on this map has now been polygonized and you can overlay it on top of the map so the old map shines through. I'll just move up to this area here. We've got some public buildings. So, give it a second, there we go. So every one of these buildings is a polygon. The information from the map is incorporated into here. And we also have the symbology. It's a building, which means in the polygons, it'll show us this color. So the different types of features, we, we assign a map symbol name, and that will decide what color things show us. So we can replicate the original color scheme of the Ordnance Survey town plan. Um, you can see on the town plan as well, they also do the interiors of public buildings. And in the Royal Commission, we actually have floor plans for some of these buildings. Um, so we will be associating those. So you'll be able to click on here and there'll be a link through to the, um, to the, to the building plans as well. Um, so I think it was approximately 7,000 polygons for the town. Um, so that kept John busy. Um, and we can also see it includes gardens, paths. It's all there. We can hang everything we want off this. Now, census records, business directories, they can all be used and associated with the individual polygons. So whenever you've got a database now, it's not just a text database, it's actually got a spatial reference. You can choose a polygon and the polygon data can be added. So all of a sudden for our estate mapping, because we have lots of private houses in mold owned by the estate owners, they are now linked into here as well. And we'll be adding different um, maps of mold that we've found as we go through as well. So you know, that's been quite a task to do, but do it once, use it many times. Okay, let's go back to the Ordnance Survey here. Oh, it's got a bit big, isn't it? Right. Okay, so once you've got the Ordnance Survey polygons, the next stage back in our process is the tide mapping. Now, as Sean mentioned, all the tide mapping for Wales has been digitized already as by the National Library of Wales and the Places of Wales website. But what we've done, we've taken the handful of maps for our project area and we've, we, 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 we've tweaked it a little bit. So if we put the Nerquist tide map on top, um, if I just do this, give it a second. Okay. So you can see we have the tide map here, all polygonized um, to the Ordnance Survey from 1870. You can still see the Ordnance Survey Railway here. But what, so what we've done is using that as the basis, we create a new polygonized data set, which is the Nerquist tide data set. So we strip out the Ordnance Survey things that are not required of 1840. So all the railways are taken out. Um, therefore, the river that was diverted for the railway is put back in its original position. And it also enables us to fill gaps in the tide mapping. Here, the map has been damaged, so it's difficult to tell which, which um, field parcel is where. But because we have the acreage size and we have the apportionment, 
we, we've been able to reconstruct it and put it back together again. And you can also see here that we have some what looks like some original strip farming here. When you have the different data sets, it's very straightforward to be able to swipe between them, uh, it says. Let's just do this. Um, joys of doing things live, hey? Come on. There we go. So you can see the ordnance survey mapping coming through here. Slowly. Come on. So what we can do is we can go between the mapping. We've got the ordnance survey and then the tithe mapping. So you can see how the tithe mapping comes through. Let's just turn that off. Through again. Come on. Okay, so you can see the polygons here, and you can see how for each field the tithe mapping comes through to the ordnance survey mapping behind. Sorry, the polygons haven't really come through there for some reason. Come on. There we go. Okay, so then you can see how the, the strip mapping can be recreated very straightforwardly. And then when you click on one of the tithe fields, you'll see now here, we haven't just got one record, we've got three. Um, so we've got the tithe record, number 451. You can see one of the jobs we've done here in the apportionment, it says ditto in ditto, which of course is pretty meaningless. So what we've done, we've created a second column called display name, where whatever it's dittoing, we've written in here, which is a quillity and quito tan t. So we've tidied that up to make it easier for people to use. We also have got the farm name. And what we can do is we can select the data from the data, every, all the fields associated with that farm name, and then they'll be highlighted on the map. And you'll be able to see it at a glance which uh, lands were owned by which farm. Um, we've also got all the ownership and all the, all the information in here. Uh, and then we've also got links back to the National Library of Wales. So you can see the original map. So the idea is, is that we always link back to the original archive where these things are held. So all we're acting is as some sort of like um, a portal into these things so we can head back there. Okay. Um, let's just turn that off a second. Okay. So we've got our Merquis tithe map. And now we can start to build up going backwards again. So I'm just going to jump over. Now, I have to say, this is something that was done uh, a few months ago. This is intended for internal use for project members at the moment. But this will be the type of um, resource that will be available via the website of the project and through the Royal Commission as well. And this will be available for everyone to use, access, and do your own queries. Down here, we have the attribute table that lies behind this with all the data. Um, and it shows up. And through here, you can do all your filtering searching um, you can create your own queries i want to know how many fields are done you know how this size how many fields are named this and also because it's in a gis system we can also drape this over a digital terrain model so you get this in 3d so you'll get the actual height of everything as well and you'll be able to view your search results in a 3d environment i'm just going to pop over okay so this is the this is Back in the GIS, we do most of the work in before we output it to the web mapping. So there's the project area. There's Nerquis, and there's Trivin, which was completed yesterday. So we have two adjoining parishes now. Just turn off. Doing things online live was a bit tricky. Oop. There we go. Okay, so we've got our two parishes now. So in here, we've upgraded the um, the tithe information. It was upgraded this week. Just, there we go. Um, so you click on the field. This is the same information which you saw before. But now you'll notice we've added a gender column to the landowner and to the occupier. So um, 
during our advisory board, it came up somebody was working on land ownership by women in the 19th century. And it was like, can we do anything with that? And we thought, actually, yeah, that's not going to take very long. So we managed to add two columns into the data, um, defaulted it to male, and then ran, ran our fingers through looking for female names, put female across. Hopefully, hopefully we've got that right. There's a couple of Francis's. I'm not quite sure which way that, so I don't know. Um, but hopefully we're not too far off here. So we'll be able to search for land ownership by gender as well. And that will raise some interesting questions and conclusions, I'm sure. So we have all this. Now, the next step was to go back. How do we get back behind the tide map? Where do we go next? The next step for us is the enclosure mapping. Now, unfortunately, um, we haven't quite got as far as all the enclosure mapping. In fact, I think John's doing the enclosure map tomorrow. So I'm afraid we're just a tad early to look at that in detail. But what we do have is an outline of the common land that existed at the time of the enclosure. So if I just turn on that and that, you'll be able to see that everything in this pink area here in 1800 was common land, pre-enclosure. So what we'll do next is we'll remove all the polygons in this pink area, and you'll be able to see what the landscape actually looked like before the enclosure. So this is very useful. A, it reduces the number of polygons where things could potentially be, because we know they weren't there, because we know the enclosure ward plops them in and saying, this is where we're going to put things and this is who it's going to be um, awarded to. So we have done all the work on the enclosure award. That's all been tabulated. And if you've ever seen one of the enclosure award um, pages, but they are rather tedious compared to the tithe ones, which are all tabulated quite neatly with columns of numbers. Uh, the, this award is very, very wordy. It repeats the same sentence of every clause and it gives you the number and then it gives you how large it is. So we've tabulated this data so it will work on the GIS system. So all of these plots you can see under here, which have been faded out, each one of those has a number, uh, an area uh, and an owner who was awarded it as part of the enclosure award. But that means, so the enclosure acts as a double map in a way. It shows us what was built, what was planned, and I have to say 95% of it did seem to have happened as well. Although we have found a couple of interesting features whereby something on the enclosure award was dotted in, and sometimes at a corner um, on the Ordnance Survey map, you'll find a stone. And I wondered what these stones were in the middle of nowhere. And when you put the enclosure ward on top, it becomes clear. They were stones that were going to be used as a point where a line would be built to and then across from. But that wall was never built. So that stone is left in isolation. But the enclosure ward helps explain these stray stones on ordnance survey maps. And it's quite useful. So you can see here how much of the parish was removed. And we know that this boundary between the common land and the enclosed land was in place as far back as 1620. So this was a boundary for nearly over 200 years here. Um, which is interesting, is so it got this far and stopped for 200 years before it went any further. So there's all sorts of interesting questions that can come out of this. Um, the 1620 map um, covers this area of Trivin round here. If you just notice this Y-shaped road here, and I'll just quickly flip over here to show this. So here's the Y-shaped road we've just been looking at from the tithe map data. Uh, you have to excuse the poor image, it's just a quick research shot in the reading room. We're having this map scanned properly in the coming weeks and will be incorporated into the system. But there's the Y-shaped road. You'll notice the boundary here is the same as here. Then there's a gap, which is here. And then this shape around here, you can clearly trace around here. And you see this little sticky in bit here, which is over here as well. So we know that the field system from 1620 to today hasn't changed very much. A couple of the fields have been divided further. Um, a couple of things have been not divided. They've been sort of been merged. But most importantly, we get um, the adjacent landowners. And this helps us to build up this stepping stone approach, trying to understand all these adjoining estates. 
as Sean said, if you go into an archive and you're trying to look at an area of what state own this area, it's very, very difficult to find out. So what we'll have will be a patchwork of all of the estates in the area, which will all show up on the map as different colours or how, however you wish to sort it. And then you'll be able to click on any field and it will give you for each layer the owner of that field. And then you can build up a complete history of each polygon or if it's been split or merged over the years will all become available um, with links back to the original archive item. So here we can see the Earl of Derby. Now, the Earl of Derby was a, quite a large landowner in this parish, but the Earl of Derby's records aren't in Flintshire or Denbyshire or Aberystwyth, they're in Lancashire. So we then have links out to different archives. And I think I have a correction on the, some of it in America as well, at Huntington Library and something in America. So it's a way of linking up disparate archive records as well. And we can build up this stepping stone approach to all these, um, all these different um, <coughs> landowners and estates. Uh, just another quick example as well. Here's another, excuse it being upside down, I was trying to orientate it with this. This is the tithe map. So you can see here this shape of field, that one, the house, and there, which is replicated here. And this is 1733. So this is 100 years before the tithe map. But as you can see, the field shapes are easily identifiable. And you can see that sometimes they've been split or merged. And also on here as well, we can see further details. And although I can't be 100% certain, I think this is actually the direction of ploughing in each field as well, because it varies from field to field, although don't quote me on that. But again, you can see the, the adjoining landowners is Mr Gifford. We know who Mr Gifford is because he's got records elsewhere. We go and find those. And he's got a similar map for his estate that fills in the gaps. So you build up this detailed map no one map covers all the project area pre-1838, but there's a dozen or so, dozens of maps that cover the whole area at slightly different dates. And every one of those will have its own polygonized layer. And then whatever date you're looking at, you'll have, you can pick the polygonized layer closest to the date you're concerned with, and you'll be able to see what the landscape was like, who owned what, click on every single parcel. And this is what we've had in the past. We've had people who've done similar work to this, but often there's a research question. And the idea is, I'm going to look at these maps to answer that question. So they do a lot of work, but they ignore some parts of what's on the map because it's not relevant to the research question. Our attitude here has been, we're going to do everything on the maps. So everything that's there will be recorded, attributed and polygonized. And then whoever comes along in the future can ask questions of that and you can ask any questions you like and it will be there and the fact that we can put it in the 3d we can have it at different time scales so we have a spatial and a temporal element to every single polygon on the map now also we're at the if you're an archivist and at the cataloging stage you've got a deed or a document and it talks about three or four fields you can look at the date you can go to the system choose the map layer for that area closest in date see if those field names exist, it's a good chance they will. And then those polygons can be attributed to that catalog entry. So when you catalog, you do your traditional textual catalog, you add the polygons, and then as soon as you press save on that, that link is then available on a map. You can click on the map, and get to that document. And this makes looking through estate records a lot easier because they are very, very complicated and very, very vast. And it's very difficult to orientate yourself within them. Um, other things we can add, as, as, as um, Sean was talking about, we have perambulations of borders. These are very interesting and named things, charters, rentals, mortgages. Every single document, because we know um, we've got the polygons as we go back, we can assign those polygons to each document. It's very straightforward. And our oldest charter we have is 1200 for our project area, part of Valley Crucis. Also as well, once this work is done, all the place names are recorded in the table. Now, place name research is often more interested in the linguistic side of things. However, from my perspective, I've always been quite frustrated about the spatial side of some of these things, lists of field names, but I don't know where they are. And sometimes it's not easy to find. So what we'll be able to do is generate a report. So if you wanted the place names of Merquist Parish, you can run a report. Each polygon has place name forms at different dates from different documents, and that would be generated as a report. Um, or you could say, I want to look at all the, you know, three void names or you know, names or whatever name that you want to work. And they'll show up on the map and show you where they all are. 
and you can view spatially, are they near a river, are they on high ground, are they on steep ground, and does the place name reflect that? But all of that will be available to do very simple facet searching and report running once it's in the system. Um, and the, the results again can be displayed with the height data as well. Um, yeah, so the, um, as Sean was saying, you know, the, the Thomas Pennant's works, we can, we can do that. The mine mapping, all we do is add a negative Z value, height value, and that'll give us the subsurface look. So you know where the entrance into the mine is, and you've got the mind map that says, here's the entrance and it goes down this far and it goes off in these directions. Well, we can put that in to the mapping system. So you'll be able to see the subsurface mapping and tunnels underneath, this, you know, underneath the estate mapping. So something we're gonna have a play with. Technically, theoretically, it'll work. So we just need to have a little, little play with that. Um, so once you've done the work, once you've done the polygonization and all the different layers, you can interrogate it in any way you like for any research question. So we spend a bit of time doing this once and we can use it many, many times in lots and lots of different ways. The other advantage is it's easy to edit. If there's an error, if somebody spots an error or something that needs corrected or something that can be improved, it's a very straightforward task to go into the data table, make the correction, save it, re-upload it, and then it's available. So we're not stuck in a static manner with something, for example, if you do a paper publication, you publish it, if there's an error, it's a very difficult thing to correct and you have lists of verratum and all that sort of stuff. With the digital aspect, we can do it straight away. The polygons and the cataloging stage, I've already mentioned. The other thing we'd like to do as well is encourage other people to create layers for the system. Now we have, you know, as a great tradition in Britain of amateur and local historians who do immense work, really important work that nobody else was ever going to do. And if we said to them, if you do it in this format, we can provide a template as a table. If you put your field number in, your field name, and a few bits of data, if you do it in that format, we can import it into this system. And therefore, your work is being is available on a national level database and can be viewed by everybody. So things don't get lost. Things don't get restricted and end up you know, in a box somewhere and nobody ever gets a chance to look at it. We want to encourage people to do their research, but know that it feeds into a national system that's going to stay there. It will be free for everyone. We're not going to put this behind a paywall. We're not going to make it restrictive. The whole point of this is it's free for everybody to use. So the mapping layers and everything else, you'll be able to view them. If you, and if you want to um, buy the image to do illustrations and so on, the link is there back to the home archive and you can sort that out with them. So by the time we finish this project, we'll have done 1% of Wales. So there's still quite a lot of work to do. We, we, we have, you know, occasional daydreams of doing the whole of Wales like this. Um, hopefully there won't just be the two of us doing it then. Um, but I think we can continue to grow this system and enhance it. And we're always keen to hear from other people about things we could add, things we could, how we could develop it and how we can make it available in different ways to different people. And also that the, the web mapping here, it also works on your mobile phone. So if you're out in the field, you can bring this up quite literally and see things. And then I've also I just had a little play the other day with a, an augmented reality app. So you can actually be in the field and hold it up like that and be able to scan around and all, all the information will be available. Anyhow, so that's for another day. So um, I, I hope uh, you can see the, the sort of usefulness of this and what we're trying to achieve. Thank you. And thank you um, to uh, Scott and Sean for you know a, a remarkable, um, remarkable tour of what shaped looking was already a remarkable project. So if you'd like to thank the speakers by using the clap uh, emoticon, that would be great. And I will try and find where my camera button's gone, and uh, so I can actually sort of speak to people in person. Right, that's better. Um, right, um, that was absolutely fascinating and a real tour de force, I think. Uh, we have do have some time for questions, although, I mean, the depth of information included in the presentation means not too much, because I'm aware that people need their tea. Um, so, uh, do we have any questions uh, or to start us off? Please raise your hand or, uh, or add, add something to the chat. Okay, well, I've got I've got one obvious one, and it's the same for any digital quest, digital project, I mean, which is about future proofing. Um, 
how long do you think this project could i mean okay never mind how long the whole whole of wales would take how long do you think you can sustain what you've got or what you'll eventually end up with well, at the moment it's within the bounds of, of our of our um our credit system with with, with um that we get through the public sector mapping agreement so um we, we can keep it keep what we've got going that's that's not a problem again if you were to scale it up there would be issues there which we'd have to think about and that would have to be something that would um that we'd build into any future plans i mean as it is for the project area we can support that ourselves that's okay um if you went any bigger then yep that's always the question you have to ask and i know we're all fed up of having funded projects and five years later you can't find the website and all the data's disappeared somewhere and we're absolutely determined that that won't happen here i mean with the at the royal commission we have a national monuments record and we're digital archive so we are um it's something that we you know we're quite keen to do and, and keep these things available but yeah i mean the scale is infinite you know you could, you could go on forever and ever but once you have a system that works like this then you know as long as it can be supported and as long as you can continue to do it then yeah there's no reason why it, it shouldn't work but um yeah eventually it will reach a point where somebody's going to have to say yeah okay we, we, we need to keep it going but for the purpose of this project and for mm -hmm. the longevity of the small project area we're dealing with that's not a problem okay uh, okay so i've got two questions I've, there's, there's several questions coming in already um so person chris lewis um over to you chris uh, uh, thanks very much that was a wonderful inspiring talk um sean you made a slightly throwaway remark about the possibility of including the census at some point is is that I mean, it's clearly not a realistic prospect to do all the census for the whole of this small area. But would it be possible to set up a, a trial of it uh, and therefore a model to crowdsource um, other people in putting census? I mean, it, immensely difficult in rural areas. I've tried it as it happens for family history purposes for part of Mould Parish, oh. where my Lewis ancestors lived. Um, but as long as um, you as editors had some control over what crowdsourcers were putting in, um, it could be immensely valuable and productive, I think. Yeah, yeah. Sean, do you want to start on that? Maybe? Yeah, of course. Thanks, Chris. And that's very much the, the framework in which we're talking about the potential for census records to be incorporated. It's something I think we're, we want to speak to with the archives to see if they, at a future point, it can maybe run as a... Uh, as, a, as a public engagement crowdsourced initiative so um so yeah th th it's a very very early discussions on on that but I, I suppose that the point is chris that any anything that we can link into the system through the geolocatable information mostly place names it, it's possible so uh, i fully understand the complexity of what you're saying um yeah but we it, it's one of the things we might be able to trial going forward uh, i don't know if you want to add to that scott yeah i mean for example with the town of mole the fact that we know it was surveyed in 1871 so to take the 1871 census and to apply it to the town of mold if we've got there's one thing the os didn't do is record street numbers um so there's a bit of work there but i see no reason why you couldn't if you have you know if you've got the street and you know the numbering system in the street there's no reason why you couldn't associate you click on the polygon for the house and there should be a link 1871 off to the census record online i don't see any technical difficulty in doing that it's just the process of making the links um, and again in the rural areas i mean if the map layer is contemporary with the census now the os as you've seen on the 25 inch mapping there aren't that many place names in reality considering the amount of buildings there are so that's a slight thing you'd have to get to grips with but yeah theoretically speaking i, I don't see any any issue there really thank thank you thanks very much okay um question from justin then i'm going to do some of the chat and then going to you dylan okay just Cheers. Uh, thanks. Um, such an impressive project. I'm so happy you guys got funded. Um, really impressed. <laughs> Not least the um, the vectorization. You the way you talked about it so casual. We just vectorized this parish. <laughs> it's an <laughs> immense amount of work, isn't it? Um, um, 
yeah. did you do that manually? Did you use um, kind of computer vision tools? I literally today found a, a Danish project doing a similar thing using um, Trimble software to to recognize the shapes. Mm. Um, or did you primarily just adapt OS master map directly? And if you did, does that create copyright issues? Uh, first off, audience survey, we asked them first, they're fine. The um, master map polygons are now available as open data as well. So there's not really an issue there anymore. OS has opened up a lot in the last 12, 18 months, which is fantastic. And plus they provide things as API feeds now. So you can always have the latest mapping coming in. Um, we've looked at computerization versions and so on. The problem is with the first edition mapping, it's very, very busy and computers don't like it. Um, I'm currently doing another project with Geom and Abris with University where we've been looking at doing this and we've made some progress with it. Um, but again, you end up having to go in and, and correct and check. Do you know what? It's easier just to do it yourself. It really is. So you take, you take the ordnance survey master map, you do that, you put the one on top and where they match, you leave them where they don't, you, you can cut them, merge them, or in, and in places you have to draw over the original map. But we've got it down to a fine art now after much toing and froing and a little bit of swearing. We've managed to get it right now. So we've got a system now for, as you saw for the town plan, John did the town plan and we got to grips with that quite easy. There's a few little things we had to get to sort out. But by the time you've tried to automate it and check it, <laughs> to be honest with you, if you do it as a human, you're there and you just do it, you know it's done and you can move on from it and not have to worry about it. And mm. there's no hidden little artifacts, because quite often we find even the original master map from Ordnance Survey sometimes has double polygons, or there's some minuscule polygon within a line that you can't see with the naked eye until you zoom into one-on-one -on -one practically, and then it's there. But the data table shows these things, and we go through the data table and there's gaps, and why is there a gap? And you click on it and zoom to it, and also it's a minuscule half a millimeter polygon that's somehow got into the system. So we can tidy that up. And for each sheet from, because we've got the scan sheet, the georeferencing is quite a quick process. We, you know, John does the georeferencing. So three or 400 points, a couple of hours, run the spline transformation, that's done. Then we've got the actual polygonization and that probably takes a day or two per sheet. He does the polygonization, it's handed to me. I do the attribution from the book of reference. And in doing that, I get to check his polygonization. And sometimes it's like, well, that's not quite right because the acreage is out. So I go in and I can cut, merge and correct the polygon as well because I've got the, the actual data there to help me. So that process again for a sheet takes a couple of bit. So within a week, we've gone from nothing to a full thing. Um, and, and we only do this part-time. We've got other parts of the job as well, unfortunately, I have to do. Um, so in answer to your question, we think it's quicker and more accurate to do it by eye than it is to try and automate it. Okay, thanks. Did you leave in the, sorry, follow up. Go, go, did you go leave on. in go. the IDs where you've used the master map polygons uh, to link forward? Oh, the, the toids in the master map thing. We've not, but there's no problem. The problem is because we're chopping up the, the master map as well, but because it's the same geographical data, you can put the two layers on top of each other and pick up the toy that way. So the idea was that the, lots of these projects before try and create one big database over everything. You'll go mad doing that. If you create the layers that you can turn on and off, it's much easier. The user can, can do that themselves. You don't need to automate it in the database. So we found that's the best way to create all these separate layers. And then the user has control over what they want to see. Great. A uh, couple of questions in the chat before we go to Dylan. Um, so one from John Townley, which is quite a simple one, which is uh, what's the cutoff date for this uh, for this project? So what? So we, is it 1900, 1930? What is it? I think you did mention this, but I've forgotten what it was. Yeah, we we've gone rough circa 1930. One of the one of the really interesting record types that we're incorporating is the the sale particulars, the this the, the the sale catalogues of of estates, so of tracking actually how these estates broke down. Um, and you, you often in the in the sale catalogues retained in estate archives and solicitors collections locally, you see who purchased them. So you can often make 
links between how many of the former tenants managed to purchase their their their, their farms and so forth as well. So it's that it's that period when these places when these estates are starting to break down. Uh, we we don't see moving you know. Uh, closer to us than the, the 1930s ish and we're going to as scott said we're going to do some trials with with some earlier medieval stuff as well to to incorporate that so going backwards as well um and then yet yeah, you know we've got limited time for the project and um, we've got a mass of records that we could incorporate so our prioritization is first of all the the, the core layers that scott's talked about then the cartographic uh the surveyed cartographic uh, material we we reckon we've got 120 to 150 estate maps for the, the project area to, to, to incorporate in. Then those records which are rich in place name information, so the rentals, the, the valuations, the surveys and, and so forth. And then it'll probably be, be trialing the incorporation of, for example, there's a great collection of early deeds which we think allows you to to track the development of the Gwasani estate across the the 15th and 16th century to see if we can sort of show the building up of one state and then I think it'll be a case of trialing the incorporation of other things and you know reading through the questions as well uh, Alan and so forth as well we could keep adding for for the rest of our lives to, to this and <laughs> you know it's got that flexibility and built to allow us to do that if we feel so inclined. Just a quick note on the sales particulars for the estate uh, the states they often use Ordnance Survey large-scale mapping to mm. shade in the fields and so on. They often use the second edition, but for the area we're in, the difference is, 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 is minimal. Mm. And uh, we just generate a layer from, from that and say, you know, here's the 1930 sale catalogue layer for the, you know, the Kazan estate or something, and that's dropped into the system. So, um, of course, what you could do in the future, if you wanted to, you could go forward in time until you join up with the origin of digital mapping in the 1990s, and then you'd have a complete thing. But... Um, yeah, I'm not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, there's a question from Charlotte Berry, um, which is as much, I think, the archivist on the call as, uh, as for sure, Sean Scott, which is, um, it's got uh, the state records, um, as Charlotte's uh, an archivist in Oxford College, the state records covering 20 counties, and how can the project work with archivists as we catalogue? So it's an initiative process. And how do we tackle catalogue and backlogs, especially at the file bundle level, so the sort of sub, -fo sub fonds level? Yeah. Um, rather than item level, I can see that I can see that one of the things this project might do is impose a huge burden on archives, which are di find it difficult to meet. Well, but, yeah, I, I mean, mean archiving is not a sexy thing to fund. I appreciate that. I think what 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 we're hoping is that we can make. I mean, obviously, we're dealing with things that are already catalogued and already known about. And what we're hoping to show is the discoverability of these things can be enhanced. Mm. Um, I appreciate adding more. Um, more options. However, I imagine it would be a fairly quick process to go click, click, click and add it into the catalogue data. So um, if you can find it. So that would be the idea would be to make it as easy as possible. Um, you know, you know, modern cataloging systems like Atom and so on. I mean, they, they have they have the potential for the spatial information to be added into the catalogue record. It's just providing a platform where that spatial information can be made available at the cataloging stage if it's a fairly simple process of oh i want that one that one and that one and they move across then that would be great however it's something that we still need to look at and develop but i think the potential is there but primarily we're doing this for to help the discoverability of what's already been cataloged because mm -hmm. as, as anyone that they're incredibly difficult to visualize and find and who they're talking about so hopefully this will help okay thank you and, and now over to you dylan you're, you've been very patient thank you <laughs> dear, dear Sean, dear Scott, that was great. That was really fascinating. I could listen to it for hours. It's brilliant. Um, I'm sort of interested in, in language in particular. Um, so I know you, you noted at the beginning that you were looking at sort of tangible features, features of the landscape, you know, the, the, the geography in, in that sense. Um, but, but also I know you did touch on things like, you know, place names, the, um, uh, the capacity there will be uh, not only to... Um, uh, record place names but also interrogate the, the data in different ways that sounds really really exciting and uh, Sean you know you talked about initially about some of the poetry to the, the larger houses um, but we're in you know thinking about the Welsh language in this area which is of particular interest uh, um, the question about the census and it is, is a fascinating one actually because the when the census begins to record the Welsh language in 1891 um, as far as I can see the you know the, the companies that are commercially available have transcribed the censuses they just ignore that column completely 
you know it's a great shame that you know you can't get at that um but at a, at a local level i can imagine you know, working with a plan of, uh, of mold or something you know, if you can map the language by street level you know that would give yeah. you something absolutely mm-hmm. fascinating and potentially you could do it over you know 1890 1901 1911 mm-hmm. so uh, you know that that kind of thing at that micro level um it's something that's very very hard to pick up just by sort of scrolling through pages of of data to make it visual would be uh, would be marvelous so that's really exciting in the future again because i know you've got enough to keep you going the other thing i'm really interested in is is actually um recently is looking at sort of tangible evidence of the welsh language in the landscape and, and in particular without being too morbid it comes down to cemeteries poetry in cemeteries uh and um you know so gravestones they often give you you know they'll give you a name they'll give you a date they'll very often give you a specific place uh, and interesting from my point of view as well they you know they give you poetry very often uh you know so it's, it's sort of mappable so again you could i could feasibly imagine you could click on a farm name and that might link you up to you know poetry about that farm or graves and things and all these kind of things are, all would be very possible i mean i'm piling on the layers now <laughs> but i'm, I'm just yeah. i think it's very very exciting because even although you said you know you're looking at the tangible um, and actually, the gravestones are tangible, but you, you, you could probably map them individually, but you can map the data on them within the local area. Mm. Um, and, and that would be something that would be very interesting as well. So, um, well, yeah, well, I might gra- be in touch again. It's really fascinating. Thanks. Yeah, gra- graveyard mapping is something that already exists down to the yeah. tombstone level. Um, yeah. And it works on the same principle. So basically yeah. you have a graveyard, each, each one has a polygon, it's attached and the inscription is there. And yeah. in that inscription, you can pull out the place names. And what we do is just add that on top of the system. So where that exists, you could link, and then you would link to the house that's linked to the gravestone and so on. So yeah, I mean, it's the, once you've got things in a digital format, all this becomes possible. That's it's just, it, yeah. it's just getting it into the mm. digital format and having that spatial polygon on which to hang it all off. Once you've got that, as again, everything you can think of can be done. Mm. It's just it's just a matter of scale then. I know in a Welsh context, what I've found is looking at this project is that lots of things have been prescribed, not digitally, but very often they then say oh, a poem in Welsh or Welsh verses or Welsh lines, and it's very frustrating then because you know that something. Well, it's even more frustrating when you go there and you know the stone is degraded. Mm. Did someone but, actually copy then just just put that down? Um, but quite, yeah. Anyway, I'll, but, I'll keep but, quiet. But, thank but this you. is Thanks this is where the, the the local element comes in as well because a local yeah. community mm. could record that information. But we provide the template in which you record it. Here's yeah. the map of the. Here's the map. Here's the here's the the gravestones on the map because they produce these maps. You see that the gravestones are all they're all numbered and so on. But they then do, what you yeah. do is, is polygonize that, and then the local people could come along with a template, transcribe the poetry, transcribe the gravestones, link them in, associate them to the houses, and yeah, there you go. Yeah, still on. Yeah, still on. Um, uh, okay, we've got time for I think. One, no, it's one, one and a half more questions. So Julianne's been very patient. So over to you, Julianne. Hello. Hi. What a fantastic, um, fantastic seminar. It's been really, really interesting hearing about your project. It's, I mean, it's inevitable that you can definitely see what, sh- what an incredible future resource this is. I'm currently looking at a PhD project um, in Scotland, looking at Scottish coal mining landscapes, but trying to understand the the kind of change and development of those from the 18th century through to the present and I'm doing that through looking at Collier poets and also oral testimony so um, you just completely inspire me and I'm thinking oh do I need to be starting looking (laughs) looking at these types of maps as well Um, but I think my question really is is what are your kind of next steps with this information I mean this fantastic resource I could imagine that schools colleges universities um, local community groups I mean I think it's endless who would be interested in this do you have like methods of what you're going to move on to like you had mentioned impact Sean and I was wondering what type of things are you hoping to look, look at in the future 
Thanks, Julie, and thanks for your comments. Yeah, I, I think the, the collaborative makeup of the project with the involvement of the Royal Commission and the Archives and the National Library of Wales, they, they facilitate some of these opportunities. So National Library of Wales really interested on the back of their Kenevin type project about mm -hmm. opportunities from, for, for, for making their records and other collections accessible and discoverable spatially as well. And the Royal Commission, because of the role it has in terms of the broader historic environment, um, sector, you know, the, the methodology that, that we provide, we, we see them in sort of cascade in that favor of field to be. Mm -hmm. So this methodology can be reused and upscaled and adapted for different geographical contexts too. I mean, Julianne, the, the opportunities are, are sort of far reaching as well. We, we we're in touch with um, local tourism, um, uh, the, the county tourism offices as well, about how the, the information about the historical landscape and some of the features can contribute towards how they interpret it and present this area to, to develop uh, rural tourism based on the cultural and heritage of, of the area. There's lots of local interest, as you'd expect, um, um, as well. But also, like, in, in terms of future land use and management and planning and mm -hmm. policy and stuff as well, because we've, we've got this information mapped, you know, we, we can link into, for example, the the inventory of um, of ancient trees, for example, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, or flooding, things like this. So the, the opportunities, because we've got it spatially arranged for cross-referencing with other the databases and so forth is potentially pre profound so there's lots of effort lots of work yeah. was to do it so <laughs> yeah, it's really exciting it's also really exciting when you um talk about the subsurface mine workings and when you're looking to actually add that on onto the art gis as well that's incredible because you often um from the miners that i've spoken to already they, they often talk about the subsurface when you mention landscape and you talk about mining, they automatically go to that. And it, it makes you think of that that mining landscape in a very different way from someone who is clearly not a coal miner, you know? So, yeah, um, yeah it's really, really interesting. I can't wait to see more about this. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll again, it, it's something we will be, we won't be doing many of those. We'll be doing one, so it's, it's proof of concept, <laughs> um, but um, before people start expecting the whole area. Um, but yes, yes, it's, it, it's something we've looked at in the past um, and something we've played with. And, I, and again, you'll be able, once it's in the digital format, you then, although you can see it in relief on a 3D on a GIS, I see no reason why you can't view it in virtual reality as well. well yeah, so you'll um, be able to view the whole landscape in a virtual reality yeah. and, and be able to move across it and where possible move under it. Yeah. And then also you can incorporate laser scan data from buildings and laser scan data from mines could mm -hmm. be incorporated as well. Again, it, it, it's infinitely expandable, but the, 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 it just comes a point of how you keep it running when you get to that level. That's why we're sticking to a little project area. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you. OK, one final one for Marion Gwynn, which is, uh, uh, I think it should be a fairly brief but useful one for everybody to know, which is, um, will this be publicly available? So will this be publicly available only at the end or parts of it accessible as areas completed? So will it be alpha or beta versions to try out before it goes live properly? Um, I, th I think we're quite we're, we're quite happy to start putting some stuff up mm -hmm. as, as it comes through. <clears throat> um, we're not we're, as you saw, I was jumping between different systems and so on, and um, and we so it's a it's, basically it's trying to get the work done and trying to make stuff publicly available at the same time. So it won't all, it won't all come at the end. I think we will make some elements of it. Don't Sean, I think we agreed there, and we will make some elements of it available as we go. Hopefully the Ordnance Survey mapping, for example, because that's not widely available to people. Mm. Um, only people who've got a, a subscription or a part of a university can get access to the 25 inch mapping digitally. Um, and so we're quite keen to get that up and running as soon as possible. Um, so hopefully we'll make that available as a layer. Um, but when you come to merge it all into one data set, that's quite a time consuming task as well. Um, so it looks great when it's done, but there's quite a lot of work behind it all. So we will get bits out, but bear with us because we've got to do all the work as well. But as, as we go, we, with these layers will start to, to creep out. So, but I don't imagine we're going to see much before, before the autumn, to be realistic. But from then on, we should start to see things really. So keep an eye on the website. Thank you very much. That's uh, that's absolutely fabulous. I think we should wrap up there because I, I, I can hear that somebody downstairs needs his tea um, and I've read, I do as well. Um, but uh, anyway, thank you uh, to Scott and to Sean for uh, what absolutely fabulous 
uh, introduction to what is an ambitious and exciting and uh, really potentially revelatory product in lots and lots of ways as the questions have explored. Um, thank you, everybody, for your time. Thank you for, for sitting so patiently for, for, through uh, what's actually been quite a long session, but I didn't, haven't felt that way. Um, so, uh, without uh, thank you, everybody, for your questions. Uh, there's some we haven't had time to put, but uh, if you get in touch with Sean or uh, Sean on Twitter or on email, I'm sure I'll be more than happy to answer them. If any, of course, that come up um, after we've signed off, that would be great. Um, so, without, without going any further, Jochen Vajalna Nostar, thank you. Good night. Thank you.